Ministries. My name is Daniel Fitzpatrick, uh, and I serve as the Membership and Engagement Coordinator here at the International Relations Council in Kansas City. Uh, and we are so happy to have you here tonight uh, for what's happening in El Salvador. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website, www.irckc.org. With so much going on right now, it's easy to lose track of what's happening around the world, especially in places that have fallen out of the headlines or where news stories are increasingly complicated. We can't predict the future, but we do know the importance of understanding historical background and current global context. No matter your level of expertise, the International Relations Council invites you to join our engaged community and area experts for meaningful explorations on some particularly active parts of the globe. Deepen your global knowledge, nuance your understanding of what's happening around the world. We hope you'll engage with us today as we move through the program. We certainly welcome your thoughtful questions uh, through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And please do check out and share other IRC conversations as we consider a range of critical, critical issues in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce James Mulholland from the Companion Community Development Alternatives, or COCODA, who will provide some brief remarks on the work of the organization and include our panelists Vicente Cuchillas, Pedro uh, Cabazes, and Carolyn Vides. Uh, a quick note, uh, Vicente will be presenting his part of the presentation uh, in his native Spanish uh, with translation from Enrique Pineda of COCODA. Jim came to COCODA in 2014 after many years of nonprofit and community development work. He describes his role uh, with the organization as combining many of his greatest passions and principles, engaging the world where our highest aspirations meet the hard realities of life. Jim, panelists, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and Jim, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you to IRC for sponsoring this event and giving uh, us the opportunity to share some of our stories from El Salvador. Uh, COCODA began our work in El Salvador in the 1980s during the El Salvadoran con conflict or civil war. And uh, we have been collaborating with communities now for over 30 years. Um, so we are very excited about sharing a little bit of that history, a little bit about what is happening today in El Salvador, and also uh, some ways in which you might want to engage or continue to uh, learn about El Salvador. Uh, we have three excellent speakers today, and I'm going to introduce them uh, from last to first. Uh, our last speaker will be Carlene Vitas, who is the National Director for COCODA in El Salvador. Uh, Carlene will be talking about quality of life issues now and how community development is trying to address uh, some of the challenges in El Salvador. Our, our uh, next speaker would be Pedro Cabezas who is a environmental uh, activist in Central America, specifically El Salvador, uh, internationally known for this activity, specifically around mining. And uh, he'll be talking to us about uh, environmental issues and political issues around those uh, situations. And our first speaker will be Vicente Cuchillas, who is a longtime journalist from El Salvador, as well as a professor at the University of El Salvador. So I hope you'll welcome Vicente as he begins our conversation tonight. Adelante, Vicente. Puede comenzar. Gracias. ¿Ya se ve la presentación? Sí, se puede ponerlo en pantalla completa, por favor. 
pantalla completa. No, ahí, ahí, está, ahí estamos bien ya. Ahí estamos. ¿Ya? Ok. Sí, ahí se ve. Bueno, buenas noches. Vamos a iniciar nuestra exposición. Eh, mi tema es eh, hablar sobre el antecedente de la lucha, de las condiciones de vida de los, sal, del pueblo salvadoreño. Un pueblo que resiste a la pobreza, marginación y represión. La lucha del pueblo salvadoreño es histórica, porque es histórico ha sido el sufrimiento que han padecido por parte de los grupos de poder. Esta condición viene desde hace 500 años. Se data desde la invasión de los españoles a nuestro país. No sé si se va a ir haciendo la traducción, perdón. Sí, ahorita, les... gracias. ¿Se okay, va si haciendo... dices... Sí, a, a... No, yo, yo ahorita voy a, voy a traducir. Si por cada slide por, me da un, un tiempo para okay. traducir. Sí, okay. Si no, yo lo, yo lo interrumpo. Pero sí. ahí, ahí estamos bien. Ahorita voy a traducir la primera parte que usted dijo. Ok. Ok, sorry, uh, sorry for that confusion. I'm going to translate the first part of the center presentation. Uh, he says good night and he's going to start to talk about this uh, topic of the historical facts about El Salvador people, right? So uh, the title of the presentation is A People Resistant Poverty and Repression. So the struggle of the El Salvador people, he says, is historic because it comes from the Spanish invasion. So it's almost 500 years of this uh, repression. Continue, Vicente. Okay. Eh, finalización del conflicto armado de casi 22 años de duración, el desmontaje del aparato militar, el fortalecimiento de las instituciones democráticas del Estado, la democratización de la sociedad salvoreña, se legitima las elecciones para la toma del poder político. Okay, so now after the uh, peace accords that ends uh, almost 22 years of an armed conflict in El Salvador, the goals of this peace accords was to strengthen the democratic institution of the state and also to establish the uh, electoral votes to a form of the uh, of a democratic uh, country. Proceed. Apertura de la participación política de la izquierda con verdadera posibilidades de accesar al poder institucional que fue negado históricamente desde 1932 que tuvo su primera participación. Justicia por las víctimas del conflicto armado. La creación de la Comisión de la Verdad para estudiar los casos de violación a los derechos humanos durante el conflicto armado fortalecimiento de la justicia constitucional, desarrollo económico social, sentó el, un precedente importante para la búsqueda de una salida dialogada ante las controversias sociales a nivel nacional para evitar llegar a otros conflictos violentos en El Salvador, convertir el Estado en un instrumento respetuoso de los derechos humanos. Hasta ahí, uh, so another important goal of this peace accords was to give the left party a real possibility to get to the government. And this uh, possibility was historically denied since 1932. That was the first time El Salvador had a, a left uh, government. And then other goals of this peace accords uh, were the social and economic uh, development of country, also to establish uh, the dialogue as a solution to the uh, country's crisis uh, to avoid another uh, armed conflict, right? Another uh, violent conflict. Um, also to uh, uh, give justice to the victims of the armed conflicts. Um, with this part, after the peace accord was uh, was created, the commission of truths that investigated most of the massacres during the armed conflicts and uh, and tried to keep justice to these uh, victims. Proceed, Alison. 
resultados de los acuerdos de paz en general. Con el paso de los años, algunos de los acuerdos se cumplieron al 100%, otros en un 50% y algunos quedaron sin cumplirse. El proceso de desmilitarización y democratización de la sociedad se desarrolló en una situación contradictoria con los, con los procesos sociales y económicos, ya que la derecha tuvo la posibilidad de impulsar el modelo neoliberal al mismo tiempo que el proceso de pacificación, de cumplimiento de los acuerdos de paz. Perdón. La incapacidad de abordar la, adecuadamente las condiciones socioeconómicas a nivel estructural permitieron estructuras criminales desarrollarse en los próximos 20 años. So about the results of these uh, peace accords, uh, some agreements were 100% uh, fulfilled, others were 50% fulfilled, and some still remained unfulfilled. And the process also of the democratization of the society was really contradicted uh, because the uh, right party uh, that got to the government after the peace accords starts to develop a neoliberalism system. So this contradiction uh, is, uh, was a problem with the social economic development for the country and allowed the criminal structures, the gangs in El Salvador to develop uh, over the uh, next 20 years after the peace accords. Dinámica del movimiento social en estos 27 años. Se da el surgimiento de un nuevo sector social como es el sector de los desmovilizados, tanto del ejército como el de la guerrilla. El movimiento de empleados estatales fue duramente golpeado con la reducción del aparato de Estado en los años 90, pero se ha recuperado a partir del 2000. El sector campesino se ha mantenido activo, pero ha sido golpeado por la migración interna y también la hacia el exterior. Se ha activado con más fuerza sectores emergentes como el movimiento feminista indígena. So what were the dynamics of the social movements in these uh, 27 years, these years after the peace, peace accords to, to date? Uh, so new social sectors emerged uh, that were from both sides of the uh, former Uh, guerrillas, right, and the army. Also, the uh, employee movement was uh, really hard in the in the 90s. Was hit really hard by the 90s, but by, by the government, but then recovered since the 2000s. Um, then we have the agricultural sector that was really abandoned, and, and it's still being abandoned by uh, by the government. But this sector was also hit by. Uh, internal and uh, external migration. And also new uh, movements uh, from different sectors uh, emerged, such as the feminist and the indigenous uh, movements. Se ha activado con fuerza el movimiento ecologista, especialmente a partir del 2000. Tuvo un mayor éxito en el 2017 con la aprobación de la ley contra la explotación minera en El Salvador la no privatización de la salud en el 2003 y la no privatización del agua, que fue una lucha desde 2007 hasta el 2019. El movimiento universitario eh, se ha mantenido muy activo en las décadas de los 90, decayó a partir del 2009 y reactivó en el 2018 contra la privatización del agua. So then in the, in the 2000s, we have three uh, really strong social movements. First, the environmental movement uh, was really strongly activated and the, great, uh, su the greatest success of this movement was the law against uh, mining exploitation in the country. Uh, that became, became the first country to prohibit uh, mining. Uh, then the other movement was, was against the non privatization of healthcare in 2003. It started, but then was a really long fight from 2007 to 2018. 
And that's the university uh, movement. They were really uh, strong uh, after the peace accords in the 90s, then declined in the 2009, but reactivated, and mostly because of uh, this uh, common fight uh, with the environmental movement. Este periodo cierra con un movimiento social dividido políticamente ya que este, la, la mayoría del movimiento se acompaña al candidato Nayib Bukele de los sectores sociales y hacia el, el candidato del FMN se va a un sector minoritario. So this period after the peace accords ended uh, with a very uh, polarized uh, country and a, a very uh, divided political social movement. And in one part, we have those who supported uh, President Najib Bukele, and that was the majority sector. And from the other side, we have the ones who supported the Deaf Party, FMLN. En cuanto al periodo de gobierno del presidente Najib Bukele, para el 2019, el proceso de cambio social se había estancado y la población había llegado a un alto grado de decepción, que lo canalizó a través de las urnas, negándole el voto a los dos partidos tradicionales, y la población votante le dio el gane contundentemente a Nayib Bukele, que había logrado separar su imagen de las estructuras políticas tradicionales, adoptando como propuesta de campaña, Acabar con la corrupción estructural. So by 2019, the people were uh, angry with the political parties uh, because the social chains uh, had stalled at that time. So the, the population started to see this new candidate that was Nayib Bukele, and then all the voting population uh, gave their votes to this new uh, political option, right? Uh, and that resulted in the uh, weakness of these uh, traditional political parties. That was the right party and the left party. There are indicios de que este gobierno continuó con los pactos con las estructuras criminales plan de control territorial quedó al descubierto que solo era una narrativa falsa. La apropiación del estado de excepción la dejó al desnudo. Otro elemento, hay muchas evidencias que los niveles de corrupción no solo se mantuvieron, sino que han incrementado. Se persigue la, op la oposición de los críticos del gobierno. Ejemplo de ello, los periodistas, los defensores de los derechos humanos, y los líderes sociales. Se ha aprobado un aumento del desempleo por los despidos masivos, arbitrarios, violando las leyes laborales del país. So there's been a uh, clear indi indicators that the actual government, the current government is uh, pacting with the criminal structures, with the gangs, uh, with the territorial uh, control plan was uh, revealed that all was, everything was false, a false narrative with the results of this uh, plan. And the regimen of exception of the, of the government uh, practically uh, gave us a clear view of the uh, false results of the territorial control plan. Then there is also uh, a plenty of evidence of the corruption levers in the current government. Uh, but also we have some uh, indicators that the corruption has increased. So also there's indicators about the prosecution of the opposition, uh, for example, with that, that includes some journalists, human rights defenders, also some environmental uh, defenders and community community leaders that are being uh, prosecuted by the government. 
And then also the unemployment has increased uh, due to arbitrary mass uh, layoff, and this is in violation to the uh, El Salvador's uh, labor laws. Estaba implementando una campaña de ataque al sindicalismo salvadoreño, especialmente a los críticos del régimen. Algunas características. Se ha despedido a 146 directivos sindicales violando el foro sindical. Se ha encarcelado 17 directivos sindicales por hacer demandas laborales. Se ha disminuido a por lo menos 10 sindicatos con el tema de la fusión de instituciones estatales, amenaza a más. Se ha deteriorado la política social del Estado, se cerraron los programas insignas impulsados por los gobiernos anteriores. Y so the countries... Recortes presupuestarios, es que, um, no me he fijado que falta la última de la lámina, eh, recortes presupuestarios a los sectores de salud y educación. Okay. So there is evidence that the country is attacking directly to uh, the junior leaders and a lot of the junior leaders have been fired um, and also a lot of uh, junior leaders have been imprisoned by making labor demands. Um, then uh, there's also evidence of the deterioration of the state social uh, policy. So um, really important social programs that the previous government uh, had implemented were closed by the current government. And there's been also some budget cuts, some important programs in the health sector and the education sector. Mantiene la población bajo el régimen, régimen represivo, régimen de excepción, con el cual se ha detenido por, lo, por el momento la delincuencia en el país. Se ha usado para capturar ilegalmente a miles de personas inocentes que están siendo torturados y algunos, algunos casos asesinados en centros penales. El régimen de excepción se está utilizando para criminalizar la protesta social. Los líderes de organizaciones sociales que están desarrollando la lucha por sus derechos laborales, la defensa del agua y el medio ambiente se han encarcelado. Ha habido un debilitamiento de las instituciones de control del Estado, tales como la Corte de Suprema de Justicia, el Instituto de Acceso a la Información Pública y la Procuraduría de los Derechos Humanos. So the, the Salvadoran population is living under a repressive regime. The regime of exception uh, that was implemented to reduce Uh, the, the gang violence in the country has also been used to criminalize some leaders and also to arrest a lot of people in an illegal way. Um, also, these, uh, the current government has debilitated some key institutions, some key democratic institutions, as the Supreme Court of Justice, the Institute for Access to Public Information, and the Attorney's Office for the Defense of Human Rights. El respeto a la legalidad, especialmente a la Constitución. El caso de ejemplar es el presidente que ha inscrito, se ha inscrito para, la, para reelegirse. Se, instituyó, se ha destituido y se ha nombrado a cinco magistrados de la Corte Suprema de Justicia de manera ilegal. Se ha militarizado la seguridad pública impulsa un nuevo modelo económico centrado en los rubros del servicio, importaciones y el comercio. Se ha reducido el apoyo al sector de la agricultura, teniendo como resultado una baja producción. So the current government has a disrespect for the laws and for the constitution. And a, a, a great example of that is the registration of, uh, of President Bukele for re-election. And the El Salvador constitution prohibit uh, the re-election. Uh, also some uh, unjustified dismissal of five magistrates of the Supreme Court of Justice 
this happened the first day of the Congress that was in, ma in majority of the president's uh, political party. Also the militarization of the public uh, security that this is again some of the goals of the peace accords that wanted to reduce the militarization of uh, the society. Also a new economic development model uh, that is focused on services, imports, and trade is being promoted. And the government, again, is also reducing uh, the support and the budget for some uh, important sectors at the agricultural sector. And this is resulting in a low production. Ya para ir cerrando mi exposición, ¿cuál sería la dinámica del movimiento social en estos últimos cuatro años? Un sector importante de la población que mantiene la esperanza de que el gobierno cumplirá las promesas. También hay sectores que ya no creen en dichas promesas y están evidenciando los niveles de corrupción que están teniendo los funcionarios del gobierno. Ya hay gente decepcionada de la que lo apoyó. Las organizaciones magisteriales están aglutinando alrededor de la demanda de la nivelación salarial que correspondía al 2023. Las actividades de protesta en diferentes sectores de la sociedad está aumentando. So about the dynamics of the social buffering in these uh, last four years of the uh, Bukele's government, we start seeing that a, a big, an important sector of the people who supported him in the last election is start to getting disappointed with the promises uh, Bukele did. Uh, we start to see uh, more protest activities in different sectors of, of society. Uh, for example, the teachers organization are start to get in uh, together to demand a salary leveling that was corresponded uh, to this year. Uh, Vicente, gracias por su uh, conversación, pero es necesario uh... Uh, permite uh, Caroline uh, continue. Excelente. Ya estaba finalizando. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Ok. Ok, so I'm going to share my screen to continue with this presentation. And just give me a second. And tell me if you can see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Vides and I'm the director of Cocodai in El Salvador. In this part, I will try to give you a general view of the challenges in the development of the communities and what their impact is on migration. So uh, for that reason, it is also necessary to know the context in which community-based organizations like Cocoda emerge and other local organizations that are uh, or local partners uh, for Cocoda. As you already know uh, or have heard, El Salvador Civil War was never officially declared, but the conflict and massacres increased in the 1980s. Uh, the conflict left more than 75,000 uh, dead and missing, mostly of them civilians, and forced uh, hundreds of thousands of Salvadorians to flee their homes. Uh, due to the army's repression, thousands of people flew to other safer places, safer in El Salvador. They went to other countries, among them uh, to the United States, Canada, many of them stayed in Mexico trying to get to the United States. But others, like the people from Santa Marta, took refugee uh, in Mesa Grande, Honduras. And you can see here a painting from one of the murals in Santa Marta that represents those uh, mobilizations. Uh, the picture in the background of this slide is an expansion of the same painting that represents their violent and non-pleasant odyssey. And that's just an example of all the assaults on the human rights that Salvadorians in rural community specifically were suffering. 
Here you can see a picture of the refugee camp in Mesa Grande. Uh, for those who managed to escape and survive, faced many challenges and the needs were tremendous. So the people had no dwellings, no means of cooking, no way of growing food, no jobs or no education or health facilities. And it is enough to take a look at what a photograph frames uh, to understand the precarious situation in which they lived. It's in that sense that in the late 80s, some people from the United States who were in El Salvador at that time or came to the country to understand better the situation joined uh, with Salvadorians to create organizations in order to help people with the different situations among the war that they were struggling with. And that's the context with, when building with the voiceless of El Salvador, later Cocoda was created as an act of solidarity, especially because of all of them wanted to find and support a sustainable peace and end the US military ad that was indirectly funding all this violence, uh, torture, disappearances, and the assaults on human rights uh, of the population by the Salvadorian government. In this picture, you can see um, a school uh, in a community of Suchitoto that was destroyed during the Civil War uh, when the Salvadorian Air Force uh, dropped bombs in their community. So in assisting in the rebuilding, uh, these organizations uh, worked together uh, and BBES worked with the Salvadorian organizations so, such as the Iglesia Bautista Emanuel, Lutheran Church of Medardo Gomez, Comadres, and other uh, resettlement groups such as the Committee for the Reconstruction of Cuscatlan and Cabana CRC. And from this latter, uh, Ades was born. That is a community-based organization too, led mostly by members of the Santa Marta community. So with the signing of the peace accords uh, on January 16, 1992, the land redistribution was mandated by the accords but Salvadorians still needed assistance in securing their land and resettling their communities. And that was an action that was being carried out with the support of these organizations even before the agreements were signed. As you can see, BVES, CRC, and ADES uh, were created in direct response to the humanitarian crisis created by the civil war in El Salvador. And that was the reason why BVES had to change its mission due to all the needs after the war, and we became Cocoda. So central to this new commitment was working in collaboration with Salvadorians who identified several priorities, uh, because who knows better their needs, right? And everything was very basic and important. Uh, important. So for example, housing, Housing was uh, badly needing, clean water, education, and schools were essential too. So helping security land titles was necessary. And Cocoda combined its resources with those uh, of Salvadorian's organizations and communities in seeking solution to these issues. And we are still working on that because although the conditions are not exactly the same, the challenges remain great. And you can see some of the pictures that represent, it will show a little bit the work that Cocoda does along our local partners in El Salvador. So after the war, uh, the violence by gangs was added to all these challenges, which also were a direct consequence of the migration that occurred as a result of the armed conflict. A situation that in the years after 1992 also caused uh, the migration of many Salvadorians who fled El Salvador seeking security and peace once more. So as a result of this violence in March of 2022, the emergency regime was declared with the purpose of uh, combating gangs and guaranteeing the safety of the population. Something that in the first instance was and it is still a dream of Salvadorians. Uh, however, 
This has facilitated abuses by the civil national police and the armed forces and puts the rights of any, any citizen at risk. So, which in turn has led many innocent people to prison and without first having been taken to a court where good people are paying for sinners. These arbitrary captures have uh, once again raised fear in the population and currently add to the reasons why Salvadorians are fleeing uh, to find peace and security again. So this is like an endless vicious circle in which violence wants to be fought with more violence and rights that constitutionally have been taken away by those who should guarantee it are ignored. It is important to emphasize that communities continue to face problems that have been dragging on since the Civil War. However, and perhaps this is not the case for everyone, but there are organizations led by community members that, uh, due to the experience that exile gave them, learn to organize to take care of their resources and defend their rights. And this is something that Pedro will expand in his part of the presentation. So this is all that I have for tonight. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? I'm just gonna set up the presentation and um, are you all seeing the presentation? Oh. Well, thanks uh, uh, Kokoda and the International Relations Council for the invitation. Um, and thanks for the, the interest in sharing about what's going on in El Salvador. As you've heard from previous speakers, uh, El Salvador is a country that is uh, historically being in a, in a constant crisis, you know, in a, in a constant uh, state of vulnerability. And uh, we always hear uh, uh, mostly the bad things that occur in El Salvador in terms of politics and in terms of uh, uh, the economy. Uh, but there is a, a very important component, a very uh, uh, not many people talk about, uh, which is uh, the environmental crisis. And this is important because the backdrop of the political crisis, the economic crisis, uh, also there is uh, uh, the territory uh, and the geography of the country where, where we live. And, and that's uh, uh, the limitations and the crisis within that territory, the vulnerabilities of the territory make it uh, 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 essential and necessary to have that analysis in order to understand the larger political uh, issues of the country. I'm gonna to try to make this presentation very short because I'm aware of time. Maybe in another time we can expand a little more, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the slides and maybe at the question period, uh, uh, you may uh, wanna ask for some clarification. But fundamentally, uh, there is a, uh, uh, factors that uh, uh, increase the environmental vulnerability of the country. And one, a very basic, is the territorial mass. We're a country that has uh, 20,000 square kilometers, and uh, we have uh, almost 7 million people living in, in the country. That makes it the smaller country uh, in, the, in the continent with, one, with the highest population uh, uh, in the continent. We have uh, 350 people per square kilometer uh, living in, in the total mass in El Salvador. Uh, besides uh, the, uh, uh, the the lack of territorial mass for the uh, uh, the population, uh, and and when we're talking about the population, we have to consider that there is besides the six and a half million people that live in the country, there is about an estimate of two point five million people living outside of the country, mostly in the United States, Mexico, and different parts of Latin America and Europe. Uh, but that's a, a, a ratio of population and, and territorial mass makes it a, a country that is already uh, experiencing what uh, the Latin American Economic Commission uh, calls uh, water stress, means that the country uh, does not 
produce enough water to maintain the, the population. And this is uh, due to deforestation. Uh, only 10% of the national territory is considered a reserve, uh, forest reserve territory uh, compared to the rest of Central America where we have uh, between 60 and 70% of the national territory that is considered reserve territory. So we don't have a lot of forest left. Uh, the, this deforestation generates uh, uh, erosion, like uh, highly concentrated erosion. We lost, we lose about 150 million tons of top soil every year due to the rains, and that uh, uh, shows in the country. If you look at the at the uh, at the uh, uh, pictures next to the slide, you will see like a sub how how heavy it is the impact of erosion in the country. Uh, also, because of uh, uh, the, the the lack of uh, topsoil, there is a high consumption of agri agri agrotoxins that make the country uh, one of the most contaminated in the region. According to the Minister of the Environment, about 90% of the uh, clean water of the uh, of the uh, water of the uh, resources of the country is contaminated. I mean, the, and, and we're talking about the, the surface water, rivers, lakes. Uh, uh, lagoons, 90% of that water is already contaminated. Um, we're a country that as well, you know, that, that uh, has a lot of volcanic activity, 50 volcanoes in a, concentrated in a very small territory. From those 50 volcanoes, we have about uh, uh, 25 that are considered active, and uh, seven of them have uh, presented recent activity over the last couple of hundred of years, uh, and about four of them that are already uh, uh, um, uh, have activ activity that is visible. Like we have, uh, 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 for instance, the Chinchantepec volcano has uh, 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 been uh, erupting over the last uh, five years. There has been two uh, evacuations from that volcano because you can see the fumaroles of the volcano. And we have uh, volcano lakes like the Coatepeque Lake that has a lot of activity, uh, uh, but because it is a lake, the way that activity shows is by the release of chemicals in the water and the sudden change of colors of water. It could be green at some point, it could be turquoise at some point. And a lot of people consider that a, a, a nice uh, a touristic feature, but the truth is that is, it is uh, volcanic activity that uh, uh, contributes to the vulnerability of the country. The fact that we have uh, so many volcanoes in such a small territory also makes El Salvador a country that is exposed to uh, high levels of seismic activity. On a regular basis, if you were in El Salvador today at about one, two o'clock in the afternoon, you will feel a movement in San Salvador, uh, and this occurs on a regular basis. You know, like we have uh, uh, every day at least one or two uh, uh, seismic movements. Uh, when it is uh, above uh, four degrees in the Richter scale, uh, the the movement is uh, uh, you can feel it. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's it's just an underground movement. Uh, and if it goes beyond uh, seven or eight degrees in the in the Richter scale. Uh, it could create a, a, a it could cre create a, a, an earthquake, a heavy earthquake where there is a destruction of the of the local infrastructure. Uh, if you look at the history of El Salvador, you 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 realize that uh, 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 there is earthquakes on uh, every 15, 20 years that you have earthquakes. We had one in 1976, uh, one in 1986. We had two in 2002, and uh, since 2002 we haven't had one, but we're Literally, on, on an average, we're overdue for a big earthquake movement that may happen in El Salvador in, a, uh, in, in the near future. Uh, the other problem that we have that adds to the environmental vulnerability of the country is climate change. Yeah. We are in a geographic location. Uh, we're in the lower part of uh, Guatemala and Honduras. So every time there is a, a, a heavy rain, for instance, we receive the waters from Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, we are now just coming out of a state of emergency of three days of heavy floods that have occurred. And uh, uh, normally uh, uh, the, the, the country is, is very affected by, uh, uh, by floods. Uh, it's also uh, affected by droughts uh, during, the, during the dry season. And these have an impact on the economy as well, right? Uh, for instance, one of the, uh, in June this year, we had a three week drought that ruined uh, a large percentage of the corn production of the country. Uh, the basic uh, uh, diet of El Salvador is based on beans and corn. So during the during the June, uh, we uh, we lost a lot of the uh, corn production due to a drought. 
And now that we have had a, 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 a tropical storm that has affected the country for the last three days, uh, many people are afraid and many people are reporting in the communities that the, the, the bean uh, uh, production will be, will be lost by, by many small farmers. Uh, that uh, impact uh, has, uh, 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 is a result of climate change, obviously, because we now the, the weather patterns are, are, are a lot more extreme than they used to be uh, in the past. Uh, 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 but in a, in, a, in a context of vulnerability of El Salvador, we, uh, 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 we, we have high levels of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of impact. Uh, the United Nations tells you that 80% uh, uh, of the Salvadorian uh, territory, it's uh, a vulnerable territory. Uh, and that 80% is over 75% of the population that lives in that territory. And 90% uh, of the economy occurs in that vulnerable territory. So uh, when we're talking about uh, 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 lack of development, uh, not only it is impacted by, by the poor political choices that are made in the country, but also by the, 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 the environmental conditions that we have uh, uh, that are natural conditions and that are compounded by the, by the poor uh, planning that is made by, by governments and by the... Uh, uh, by the uh, inequality that exists in the country. Um, and then the, there is, uh, besides the natural activity, there is the, the commercial activity, there is the human-made activity that contribute to the vulnerability of El Salvador. You know, we have uh, big industries like mono, mono agriculture uh, that, that uh, uh, monopolizes long uh, swaths of territory uh, in, in, in when in the mono agriculture, there is the indiscriminate use of pesticide and other agrotoxins. Uh, there is the, con the construction industry and other industries uh, like the mining, for instance, that in the long term, they have left uh, a lot of destruction and, 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 and uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, problems in the country. Uh, all of this occurs in a context of unregulation meaning that uh, the, the control that the, that the commercial, that the economic groups have in the government and the push, as, as Vicente was mentioning, for uh, measures in the country to not regulate uh, the, the, the economic, in, the, the, the economy uh, generates uh, conditions for the, for the contamination of the country now. So given this uh, 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 level of vulnerability in the country, as Vicente was mentioned, that uh, since the year 2000, the environmental movement has uh, 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 grown strong and it has uh, pushed a lot for government regulation to, uh, or for government policies that uh, first uh, 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 recover a lot of the environmental uh, damage that had been done, but second, try to mitigate the impacts of, uh, of uh, the environmental problems in the population. And in that sense, uh, there has been a push for a constitutional reform to recognize the right to food and water, uh, to regulate the, the, the use of water with the general water law, uh, to implement strong policies of disaster mitigation and civil protection, and uh, uh, to ensure that there is food security uh, in the country. Uh, because as Vicente was mentioning, a lot of the, 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 uh, the vulnerability of the country has to do with the fact that the government does not support the local agriculture. And even this government is moving towards a service uh, economy uh, but that makes us very uh, reliable on imports for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the daily sustain sustainability of the population. One of the important victories that uh, we had in uh, in 2017, as mentioned by Vicente, was the uh, uh, prohibition of mining, and and that was a struggle that took place over uh, 12 years in the country uh, with a lot of loss of uh, human life due uh, human life. Uh, due to uh, 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 repression against environmental movement, uh, particularly this, uh, the, the environmentalists, anti-mining environmentalists that were assassinated, were assassinated in the, in the area of Cabañas. They were linked to ARES, uh, uh, the Association for the Development of El Salvador, because they were fighting a, a mine, a Canadian mine called uh, Pacific Rim uh, in Cabañas, which was one of the epicenters of the mining struggle. And, and the reason why we were opposed to mining uh, uh, is because at some point the Salvadoran government has allocated about uh, 25 uh, mining permits in the northern part of El Salvador. If you look at this map here, 
uh, you, it, it, this is a map developed by, by mining companies who had identified what they call the, the gold belt of Central America. And, and these pink parts is, is where the, most of the gold is where most of the gold is located. And if you look at the, at the, at the how this affects El Salvador, it affects the northern part of the country. You know, it's almost half of the country, mostly in the northern part. And that northern part of the country is where we have uh, most of the water that the, the, the clean water that we still have left in the country is produced in the northern part. Uh, is where most of the forest that is still available uh, as a forest reserve for the country is located in, in the northern part of the country. And a lot of the production of uh, beans and corn is produced in that, you know, which are the, the, the two key things for the Salvadorian diet uh, uh, are produced in the northern part of the country. And uh, uh, so the population in general, like social organizations, political parties, the church, uh, the uh, 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 different local uh, uh, organizations agreed uh, and came to the consensus that uh, it was worth having a big fight to prohibit mining in the country uh, because all, all of our, uh, our, our livelihood as, as a nation would be jeopardized if the mining industry was introduced. Uh, I don't have time to go through this map, but this is just to give you a sense of where the, how the mining industry was going to affect the country. This is a, a, an, eco, a, an economic development plan that was developed by the SACA government, uh, by the Flores government back in 2002 where they plan to introduce uh, the mining activity in the country. And as you can see in this, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the top of the, of the, of the, of the map, uh, these are like the, the little squares are the mining concessions that the, the, the government was going to introduce. And they were already those concessions assigned mostly to Canadian companies. Uh, the, the black line here is a highway that, that was constructed to facilitate the mining activity and the, and the red and green spots are uh, uh, hydroelectrical dams that were gonna be created to, uh, uh, to facilitate, to provide power to the mining industry. Uh, and as you can see, the, the green, uh, I mean, the, the, the blue lines are the main watersheds of the country. When you look at where the mining was going to take place, uh, you, you, can take, you can tell that the, all the watersheds of the country we're going to be affected. Uh, re remember that I told you earlier that the water uh, runs from Honduras and Guatemala towards El Salvador uh, and, and it uh, ends in the Pacific Ocean. So if the mining activity was uh, uh, developed in this part, all of the contamination related to the mining activity was going to come down to, to the different uh, watersheds of the country and was going to affect not only the, the the population, but also economic activity related to, to the water, like cattle ranching, agriculture. So the, the fear by, by generalized by the population was that, uh, uh, that, was that uh, mining was uh, uh, going to be, uh, many people call it uh, 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 the last coughing of the nail. <laughs> uh, it, it, and it was a death threat for a large amount of the population. Uh, so luckily, in 2017, there was a national consensus where uh, 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 that included the church, political parties, as I said, like social movements that pushed the government towards uh, 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 towards a prohibition. But despite of the fact that there was a prohibition, like the, the law uh, was never applied. Uh, there was uh, 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 like the different uh, legislation that uh, affects mining was never changed. Uh, uh, for instance, investment uh, laws, for instance, I still haven't excluded mining as a, as a form of investment in the country. Uh, international uh, 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 agreements, trade agreements have not included mining as, a, as an exception to the, to, the, uh, to the investment in the countries. Uh, still like uh, the, there is 15 mining sites that, uh, uh, that have been identified from previous mining activity that are producing contamination and those mining sites have not been closed. Uh, the victims of uh, mining violence, uh, uh, the people in Cabañas have not been uh, uh, given reparations uh, for the violence that occurred against them. And artisanal miners that are uh, a very uh, important part of the, uh, 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 of the mining industry have not been given opportunities to transition from artisanal mining into other mining possibilities. Um, there is uh, the, the, the current situation, as, as uh, uh, Vicente explained, uh, 
uh, has changed a lot. Uh, uh, we have a government now that is standing towards uh, militarism, uh, but despite of the fact that, that there is all these uh, violations to human rights, but all these uh, uh, conditions where like all the rights of the population are not uh, uh, being respected, uh, Nayib Bukele remains a very popular president in El Salvador and internationally. Um, this is because he has implemented a, you know, an effective uh, uh, policy against gangs, which was a, 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 an issue that affected El Salvador for decades. And a lot of people are, you know, are seeing a, a very tangible uh, 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 change in their communities uh, in terms of uh, uh, security. However, uh, 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 people at the same time are uh, reporting that there is a lot of economic uncertainty that is being generated in the country. Uh, 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 and this is because the government is spending a lot of money on, on gangs, but it's also at the same time as the, that is increasing the, the budget for uh, uh, police and the military, uh, the budget for education, health and social security have been decreasing over the last few years. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, so the government is right now feeling the pressure to uh, uh, to attract foreign investment because you know its economic policy is, is failing. You know uh, the, we are the most indebted country in Central America. Uh, we in in this year we are the country that has attracted the least foreign investment. As a matter of fact, uh, foreign investment has decreased compared to the the last three or four years. Uh, we are the slowest growing economy at uh, less than two percent uh, 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 per year. Uh, compared to four to five percent with the rest of Central America, the inflation is out of control, and the attempts that the government has had to uh, uh, dynamize the economy have failed. Like the Bitcoin, the government has invested over three hundred and fifty million dollars in uh, in trying to introduce Bitcoin into the general population, but as far as everybody can tell, like that has not taken off. Uh, there hasn't been investments related to Bitcoin. There is no use of Bitcoin in the general population, so. It, the, the economic policy of the government has been a failure, and they know that uh, uh, the, the, this is it's a, it's a growing problem. And eventually, you know, the, the bubble that the government has generated will not uh, 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 will not last. So the, definitely, the government is feeling the need to attract foreign investment. Uh, that need to attract foreign investment makes it uh, uh, makes mining a possibility for the government. You know, and, and we have been seeing signs that uh, 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 the government is uh, interested in, in, in bringing mining back to the country, uh, despite of the fact that most of the population are oppo is opposed to it. Uh, for instance, since 2020, we have heard people in Cabañas saying that uh, uh, there are foreign nationals offering like local development projects. These foreign nationals are not identifying themselves and they're they just saying that they work for a mining company uh, uh, we have identified real estate companies that are purchasing large tracts of land in in, uh, in El Dorado. El Dorado is the the the, the community where uh, the Pacific Rim Mining Company operated its project. Uh, and the government has also making uh, uh, is also making some uh, 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 moves that uh, can be interpreted as if they are creating the conditions for the uh, uh, the mining prohibition to be. Uh, reversed uh, uh in 2021 pedro, pedro mm -hmm. my apologies yes. but we're gonna have to close up we're running out of time and i want to give daniel just a few minutes for questions so can you summarize in about a minute yeah so in 2028 uh, uh in 2021 the government joined the intergovernmental forum on mining and they have made it they are making some uh, uh some uh, uh, uh moves to revert the mining law uh, Part of what the government is doing, as Vicente explained as well, is uh, persecuting anybody that is considered uh, a political enemy of the government. And in that sense, uh, uh, since uh, January this year, uh, five uh, members of the Santa Marta community, including the executive director of Ares uh, uh, and the legal uh, advisor were detained uh, under the pretense of a charge that, uh, of a crime that supposedly happened uh, 34 years ago during, in the context of the civil war. Uh, the attorney general, despite of the fact that they uh, have made this charge and have detained uh, 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 the five leaders of Santa Marta uh, for nine months now, eight months, they did not have any uh, uh, 
access to legal advice. They, didn't, they haven't had access to their families. They didn't have uh, access to medical uh, uh, support. Uh, they, uh, the, the attorney general has not been able to provide any, any evidence of, of this case. And they continue to persecute in despite of the fact that there has been an enormous, uh, very uh, successful campaign to denounce the detentions at the national and international level. Yeah. We were lucky that in, two, in uh, August, they were uh, released uh, into home detention, but we're still uh, having a campaign uh, to, uh, uh, to have them released and to have them exonerated from the charges. Uh, I'll leave it at that and then uh, uh, any questions, uh, we can go ahead. Wonderful. Uh, Pedro, Carolyn, Vicente, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights with our group. We really, really appreciate that. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat that I would like to get to uh, before we close things out uh, and feel free any of you three to, to jump in. Uh, the first one uh, would love thoughts on what El Salvador would look like five years from now. Can I go? Yeah, yeah, please, Pedro. Yeah, absolutely, Pedro. Very quickly, I mean, five years from now, we have had a a, a dictatorship consolidated. Uh, the consolidation will occur in February, uh, twenty twenty four, where we have an a illegal election of a president that uh, uh, that has already accumulated uh, a lot of a lot of power, has control of every institution of the country. And uh, uh, we, we, we're concerned that uh, uh, in five years, uh, the economic uh, uh, crisis will have deepened and there will be a lot more social conflict uh, than the one we see right now, but at the same time, a, a lot of repression. If anyone is a follower of what's going on in Nicaragua, we see Nicaragua as the mirror of what's uh, going on in El Salvador, which is gonna be a lot of persecution of students, uh, persecution of labor unions, persecution of journalists, that has already started, but it hasn't really intensified as much as uh, as it has happened in Nicaragua. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, I think we have, uh, you know, like what we have been describing of the current situation of El Salvador will continue, but it, in much higher dimension. Thank you, thank you for the for the frank answer, Pedro. We really appreciate that. Uh, another question is on migration, uh, excluding migration from El Salvador itself. Uh, has El Salvador's issue affected transcontinental migration? Uh, and in turn, has that migration affected social and environmental pressures within the country? Uh, or does migration tend to completely bypass the country and be viewed as irrelevant? Carlene, do you want to take that one? Talk about migration in and out of the country? Uh, yes. Uh I think that maybe one of the things that I can mention about this, it's like, for example, the remittances in the country have become the most important uh, source of foreign exchange in the national economy. And it, it is then an economy based on remittances as articulator of the productive and commercial apparatus. So therefore, since the 80s, we begin to depend increasingly on remittances and to the extent that the economy increasingly depends on this subsidy becomes more vulnerable. So in the social sphere, uh, remittances have had a double effect. And firstly, migration relieves social pressure on employment, social services, and uh, on access to productive assets, which generates a buffer effect against uh, potential conflict. And, uh, Secondly, immigration and sending remittances represents an apparent strategy, indirect means uh, of combating uh, poverty outside of public policies. And for the, uh, for the migrant, it um, represents the possibility of improving the quality of life and for the recipient families and increasing their income. So it allows them to satisfy their needs and for the family receiving this, uh, what represents a significant subsidy without which the needs for food, education, housing, and others could not be satisfied. 
And that is something that maybe it is very remarkable about how it affects immigration inside the country and the economic, economical activities too. Yeah, let me just for, for North Americans, remittances is the term Salvadorians use for the money sent back by uh, immigrants to other countries, primarily the United States. So when, when uh, Vicente and others were mentioning the millions of people that are Salvadorans who live other places, they send that money back. Uh, I think it's about 30% of the, the gross national product. So you have a, a cycle where you almost become dependent on the migration because that provides such a strong economic uh, influx. So uh, for Salvadorans, it's hard to see migration as a negative. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's certainly people don't wanna leave their country, but but in terms of the economy, it's almost become uh, a necessary part uh, of the economy. Wonderful, Maybe thanks. Can you add a little bit about that too? Because we're talking about transcontinental migration. Uh, the fact that there are so many Salvadorans out of the country and that there is dollars that come into the economy, uh, and the fact that we have an economy that is dollarized uh, uh, makes uh, labor in the countryside a, a little more uh, scarce. Uh, so we have industries like the sugarcane, for instance, that uh, uh, require short-term, uh, very uh, 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 vulnerable labor uh, in order to operate and maintain and maintain his large their large profits. And the communities in El Salvador, because of the migration to the United States. They, uh, they are not able to supply for that labor. So we have uh, workers from Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala that come and supply that. You know, It's a short-term uh, migrant labor that comes from the Central American region. But people that are looking for dollars because it's an easy way to get dollars uh, for the rest of the Central American region. Just one fact about that. Yeah, and, and we should say that El Salvador does not have its own currency. It uses the US dollar, which is a, a fairly unique and uh, uh, kind of double-edged sword for, for El Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jim, Pedro, Carolyn, for, for sort of specifying there. Uh, we have one final question uh, in which uh, the person asked the question said, one, really appreciate everyone sharing some of the pressing issues in El Salvador this evening. Uh, thinking sort of from an asset-based approach, uh, what are some things that are going well uh, in the country right now? We should leave that to Vicente. Me traduzco la la pregunta, Vicente. Okay. Eh, preguntan si podría mencionar algunas cosas que están yendo bien o que están bien en el país. Algunas cosas que estén yendo algunas bien. Cosas, sí, algunas cosas buenas del país. Lo único que se puede expresar en este momento es la cuestión de la reducción de la, de la violencia de las estructuras criminales. Eso está claro. Nadie lo puede negar, pero tiene dos elementos negativos esto, aún esto. Uno es eh, qué necesidad había de hacer semejante, diríamos, atropello de derechos humanos para combatir la delincuencia. Eh, como se ha hecho, no era necesario. Segundo, este es qué tanto eso se va a sostener en el tiempo porque todavía hay muchas evidencias de que la situación del pacto con las pandillas eh, eso está de alguna manera vigente así es que hay esa preocupación así es que tenemos como una especie de como digamos de, de, de ojo de huracán ¿verdad? el ojo de huracán que da una tranquilidad pero todos sabemos que pasando el ojo del huracán viene otra vez, diríamos, los vientos, el, el ventarrón. Para que traduzcas. Okay. Okay. So about the question of uh, a few things that are being good in El Salvador, Vicente, can you just think about the reduction of violence, of gang violence? But he is also worried about these two uh, negative sites of this reduction of violence uh, because of the regime of exception. So uh, if you focus that worries in two questions, one is what was the need to uh, violate a lot of human rights 
uh, with the regime of exception. And the other one is if this strategy of reducing violence is sustainable in time. So uh, we know the evidence about government uh, acting with the criminal structures and with the gangs. So uh, we ha we are like a, a we really worry on that, and we are in a kind of a state of calm right now. But we know that later we're gonna see the results, the real results of this strategy. Uh, can I add some, can I add, can I add something here? Uh, in in terms of asset based uh, evaluation. I did community development in the United States for many years, and I do want to say that I think one of the huge assets in Central America, specifically El Salvador, is um, grassroots organization, that I have probably seen uh, no country or no place I've ever been that is as organized at a grassroots level. I mean, every community has a, a junta directiva, uh, there are women's groups, there are youth groups. Uh, this is a country that, because of the Civil War, had to take community organizing very seriously. And I think that is an asset that, that's allowed them to, to fight uh, environmental issues, uh, political issues, in a way that other countries perhaps are not as equipped for. So uh, I do think that is one sign of hope, that this is a country of... Uh, it, there are far more people in communities in El Salvador engaged in the political process than there are in communities in the United States. I would just say that. Jim, thank you so much for sharing, for sharing those insights, Vicente as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been on the call for, for joining us for what's happening in El Salvador. Uh, we're so grateful that you took time out of your evening uh, to join us for this conversation. Uh, and so tremendously grateful to Vicente, Jim, Enrique, Pedro, Carleen, uh, for taking the time to, to educate our, our audience uh, on the current situation in El Salvador. In the second half of 2024, a delegation of community leaders from Nicaragua and El Salvador uh, will be on a tour of the United States with Coco Da, uh, including a stop in Kansas City for an in-person speaker program uh, facilitated uh, by the IRC and our friends at Coco Da. So please stay tuned uh, for more information on that in 2024. Do visit our website at irckc.org. Uh, do visit CoCoDAs at CoCoDA.org uh, to learn more about our programs. We look forward to seeing you soon and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much.